Stop messing around, stop fooling around, stop delaying, stop procrastinating. Get up, get out, get it done. Everything is possible, nothing is a problem, and anything can be overcome. I just get my ass up out of bed, I get my shit together, and I get out and I start the fight. And that will transform you from uh, a mere mortal into a superhuman being. I've never, ever, ever met anybody who told me that they got rich watching their IRA or their 401k. All right, so Peter, welcome back to the Reaction Room. Hey, George. Uh, how you doing today? I'm great today. Fantastic. Summer's over. Uh, yeah, it's true. It's, it's a bummer. It's a little sad. Although not, not officially, right? I guess we got we got another like five days before yeah, uh, the official end of summer, but summer's over. Yeah, no, you're right. You're right. School but, starts. Yeah, yeah. Post it's Labor done. Day. <laughs> Post Labor Day. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so I got two short videos today, and uh, we'll see what you think. What right. are my instructions, George? Your instructions are just to react uh, naturally. To react. As, uh, yeah, okay. as you, you can. I talk. won't think about it. No, yeah. So you can talk through the video if you want, or wait till the end. It's up to you. Just but, react. Yeah, exactly. Just yeah, we want your, yeah. your your natural reactions and your thoughts that these things bring about. Yeah. Let's do it, man. Yeah. All right, beautiful. Here we go. The day in the life of a real estate millionaire schedule. Thatch. I normally wake up at five a.m. in the morning. That's yeah, me too. Out. And meditate. Me and too. And then I do a lot of coaching calls throughout the day. To help Good for you, man. I don't have the time to coach. And then after that, He's the man. I go out there and look at that car. And door knock and drive and look for he door knocks. He goes door to door usually I have appointments like, like a grunt. Like it's not beneath him. He just does it. That's how he gets his business. Usually after work. Makes time for family. Carves it out. He's at the kids game. There we go. I love it. I dinner afterwards and then in the evening. He reviews his goals. Man, I talk about doing that too. I set my, my goals in my calendar for tomorrow, the night before. He's talking about life balance. Look, here's a guy that achieves his life balance. He just doesn't show up and say, I want to work life balance like a lot of young people do. They, they come, they interview for jobs with me, and many of them will say, I'm looking for a big work-life balance, Peter. And my reaction is always, oh, yeah, that's what you're looking for? You have to create that. No one just gives it to you. So... My man Thatch here is saying, look, I'm making my work-life balance. I'm up at 5 a.m. I get my workout in, get my coaching in. I go door knocking. Man, I love that part that he goes knocking on that doors himself. That surprised me when I saw That's that. the best. Yeah. That's like he won't hand it off to someone right. else. It's great. Yeah. And he's at his kid's game. He's at dinner with the family, reviewing goals, setting goals uh, for, the, for tomorrow, yeah. the upcoming week. And, man, that's good stuff. But he, he ends saying life balance is key, and he's right. But he creates it for himself. He gets it for himself. He's not looking for someone else to give him a work-life balance. And if, if I have a message for anybody on this topic about work-life balances, don't expect anyone to give you the work-life balance. Don't expect an employer to give you work-life balance. Don't expect your significant other to give you a work-life balance. You have to create the work-life balance. You're the one who's setting your schedule. You're the one who's uh, doing your own time management. I mean, it's all up to you. Uh, so I, I think that's the message for me is if you want life balance or money or whatever you want, you go out and make it happen. Don't look for it to come from someone else. 100%. Cool. All right, next one. You're killing me. It's Jason on Bob Strat. Yeah. yeah. So I know that guitar. Jason's one of my favorites out there. Something else. He's great. Oh, you put up an old... Str oh. Man, I love the way he plays. I love the way this guitar sounds. George, you know I'm a vintage guitar lover. I do. And I love Jason Isbell, and, and he's got great guitars in his collection. Uh, he's, he's got the Ed King Red Eye Les Paul, uh, 59 Burst Les Paul. Uh, and he's playing this Stratocaster. It's so great. Man, I love this guy. And he gets great sound. I love everything about Jason Isbell. I love everything about vintage Stratocaster, so the fact that you chose me to react to this video in, in a business and real estate context, that's a sneaky trick. Uh, but thank you for it. I, I love it. I just, you know, when this video started, I, I melted away and forgot about that I'm sitting here in a, in a business attire and talking to you and our viewers about business and real estate and invest, investing and success and mindset and all that stuff. 
that we always talk about. And for these 30 seconds that I was watching this video, it was a departure for me. And I, I so please do more of it. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it's really good. Uh, yeah. You know, maybe one day the people in my real estate and business life will know this little side thing about me that I'm a, uh, I'm a vintage guitar lover and collector and player. And then uh, conversely, maybe the people in my guitar life will know that I'm a real estate uh, and business guy, and there'll uh, there'll be some convergence of the two communities. Sell a guitar too, and take some. Well, I don't. You know, there'll just be a convergence of the community. I, yeah. I, I, I that would be a fun thing yeah. for me. But uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Great. This that's this awesome. was a great one. Thank you for putting Absolutely. this one up. My pleasure. It's one of my favorites. Yeah. All right, and then the last one is from. It's a tweet from our old friend Nick Huber, who a while ago we did some reactions to him. So in this tweet, he says, "For every one person making it big in crypto, cutting edge stuff." There are 99 others wasting time. I was curious what you think of that. Well, he's referring to people who are methodical and have a plan and have a strategy and who stick to it and who are patient versus people that want to get in with no strategy. They want to trade. They want to time the market. They want to make a fast buck. And that's really what most people are doing. And crypto markets are so young and in their infancy, of course, it's going to attract uh, all types of investors and people with all sorts of financial and income backgrounds. Uh, but the 1% he's referring to are the ones that know that the patient money wins. And uh, look, just like Warren Buffett said, the stock market is a mechanism to transfer wealth from the, uh, the impatient to the patient. Same with the crypto market. So if you're the 99% that Nick was referring to who's impatient, I'm saying is impatient, learn the patience, man. It, it's, it's a marathon, and you're going to wake up one day in five, ten years, and if you invest right in the right crypto assets that have real utility and real use in the world and are getting adopted, and you can find out which ones those are quite easily, if you buy those now, hold on to them. I think you'll be okay. I know you'll be okay. But it's these shit coins and these Doge coins and these Shiba Inus and all this other shit that has no utility, no value, no, uh, no real use, and, you know, they, they, they show up on these exchanges and people and buy and sell and trade them for whatever reason. I don't, I don't know, but I don't want to get left holding the bag of a Shiba shitcoin that does nothing and accomplishes nothing. I'd rather hold uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, uh, Cardano, uh, Hedera Hashgraph, VeChain. I mean, these are the ones, Polygon, Matic, uh, uh, Solana. I mean, these have real use and real utility. If they get used, they'll be valuable. If they don't get used, they're not going to be valuable. Yeah, the so, network effect. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I think that's what he's talking about. Yeah. Nick, what are you talking about? Am I right? <laughs> Nick, give us a talk back. Sounds good. All right. Should we head to the table? Let's go to the table. All right. Well, Welcome to the table. You had mentioned, now this is a little while ago now, but you had mentioned to me the California state legislature passing Senate Ugh, Bill 9. Thank God. Yeah, I so don't live in California, so I'm free to say that. Yeah. What are your thoughts? That was like, huge. Yeah, yeah. That was huge. My favorite part about this story is that they went and interviewed lots of people in the, uh, in the California government hierarchy, and several of them were quoted as saying, you know, we've tried as long as we could. There's nothing left that we had. We were... We were forced into a corner. We finally had to go with upzoning. Right. You know, like, right. like that was always available, but they chose not to do it. Instead, they tried to, I mean, California is one of the heaviest regulated states for housing. So they could have increased the supply by initiating upzoning measures. They never did. Instead, they tried to regulate, regulate, regulate. I mean, they beat the shit out of the state with regulations. And what happened? Housing prices went up. They never retreated. It's impossible to live there. The homeless problem, have you been to San Francisco or LA recently? It's fucking bananas. You can't afford anything. Even if you have money, you're like, what? I got to pay $3 million for a 1,700 square foot nothing? Like it's, you can't live anywhere. You can't afford it. It's horrible. And they finally passed uh, this bill to upzone the entire state. Yeah, no, nine allows what, two units per parcel and allows subdivision. Right, then, yeah. subject to all these zoning uh, requirements that you have to meet. But yes, it's the resurgence of the mother-daughter apartment or the in-law apartment over the garage. Yep. So that's coming back now. And it's needed 
Because look, George, everything in the discussion about housing affordability and pricing is all governed by supply and demand. You can't regulate your way out of housing and affordability. If you increase the supply, you'll be able to stabilize pricing. If you restrict supply, pricing is going to go through the roof. So over the years, all of the regulation, all of the legislation, all of the crazy shit that goes on in California's government, all it ever did was restrict housing supply. When you restrict supply and demand increases, what happens? Prices go through the roof. And that's what's happened here. And now they finally said, all right, we throw in the white towel. We'll give you what we want. We'll increase the supply. They've never done it before. They're doing it now. They tried to regulate everything forever. When you regulate, you choke the supply. It hasn't been without a lot of criticism and a lot of uh, obstacles. Like a lot, a lot of critics fear that this will, you know, quote unquote, change the character. Well, it's going to change. The, it's, y- yeah, the, 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 the NIMBYs have an argument. Yeah. Uh, look, if I lived in a expensive Tony neighborhood and, you know, the other houses were going to start building ADUs and uh, in-law units or whatever they're going to build, I'd probably be a little bummed. But look, I don't live in California, so I don't have an interest in my neighbor on my street like putting something up that's going to block my view or I have to listen to construction for a year or two or whatever the deal is going to be. But look, I will tell you, generally speaking, it's going to help stabilize the price of housing in the state of California. When you increase supply, you're going to stabilize pricing. I think this is a start. There's more that they're going to need to do. It's not going to singularly save the world. It's not a magic bullet. But I love that California's own legislators were quoted saying, all right, you win, we'll upzone. I mean, where was that thinking for the past 50 years? Nowhere. The freer the market, the greater the supply, the more stable the housing prices are going to be. Uh, Texas is doing a fairly good job of it, although the price of housing in Texas has increased. It has everywhere. But Texas has a lot of land they can build. California has a lot of land. you got to let them build. These municipalities and towns all over the country, even supply-constrained markets, where there's land, you got to zone it. You got to let them build. That's the only way to stabilize housing prices, introduce new inventory into the marketplace, into commerce. If you don't and you simply restrict the development of new product, if you simply restrict and regulate the existing product, it's going to make it impossible. And the price of the stuff is just going to go through the roof. George, if I asked you to give me an example of one state or city where they regulated housing and, and had lots of price controls on their housing product, and it worked, and housing prices stabilized, you couldn't give me one example. You can't give me one example because one doesn't exist. And this is highly documented. It's highly studied. There's published studies about this. You can't restrict supply when the population is increasing and the demand for housing is increasing with it. So you had mentioned to me the uh, something about the CARES Act and receiving assistance for paying rental arrears. Yeah. You want to hear a funny story? I always want to hear a funny story. So a couple days ago, the team and I are in the office mm-hmm. reviewing building by building the status of CapEx renovations, repairs, issues, non-payments, right? So we're looking at the non-pay list. We have a COVID non-pay list. Maybe it's about 15 people long portfolio wide. So we're always talking about these 15 people. We're in communication with them all the time. We're working with them. We're doing workouts. We're amending and revising the workouts. We're trying to direct Uh, these tenants to the programs that are issuing aid to help them pay rent. I mean, sure, it's in our interest, but it's it's in their interest. We want people to stay in the apartments. Anyway, we get the list a couple days ago. I look at the list. It's like, instead of 15 people, it's it's like three people long. I say, where are the other 12 people? Peter, everyone paid. What? How? We directed them to the county where they filled out the forms. They got the CARES Act money and were paid. And I had this empty not in my chest. It was this weird feeling. Like I I was happy and excited that people paid and we got the money that was owed to us and they were able to clear their debts with this CARES Act money. And the other half of me was like, holy shit, we got paid. Like (laughs) between the 12 people that paid, it was probably $160,000. And it's not a little bit of money. And This is taxpayer-funded money. This is part of the whole general thing that's been going on. We've been talking about how the government's printing money. This is how they print money. They send money that didn't exist anywhere. They just snap their fingers and poof, it materializes. They send it to the counties. The counties send it to the property owners. And the property owners clear out the the tenant ledger accounts that shows that there's a debt owed. 
and everybody goes on. But that money didn't exist in a safe and they pulled it out of a vault or a safe and then they sent it. They just, poof, printed it. And it's a crazy concept because there are significant ramifications to that. So look, George, when you take $6 trillion and you push it out into the populace and that $6 trillion wasn't there yesterday and then poof, it's here today, what we're seeing is that people are saving more. The poverty rates are the lowest they've ever been in history because people at the lower income levels have been able to get assistance through the extended unemployment benefits, through the various CARES Act provisions that have put money out, the $600, the $1,800, the $1,400. You know, all of this stuff is meaningful. Poverty levels are down, savings levels are up, the banks are flush with more cash than they've ever had because regular retail consumer accounts have more money in them than they've ever had before. And that's from the stimulus money, this this $6 trillion that we're talking about. Other people are taking their uh, portion of the $6 trillion that they got and they're chasing assets, they're chasing stocks, they're chasing crypto, they're chasing real estate. Well, what have we seen? Prices for stocks, crypto and real estate through the roof like we've never seen before. So all of that money chasing the same amount of assets is going to push the price of assets up. We've also started to see the price of certain goods and services start to creep up. Again, there's a supply constrained environment that we're in. The supply chains are disrupted. China, Korea, uh, India, it's tough to get goods that are typically made in those countries shipped and distributed over here. And we've got all this money, the $6 trillion, that's now chasing the same amount of goods and services. It's going to drive up the prices. That's what we're starting to see. The CPI jumped significantly a couple of months ago. It's leveled off now, but we're going to start to see a more consistent rise. Mark my words, let's come back in six months or a year and see what happened. But we're going to start to see a consistent rise in CPI and in global inflationary markers throughout all sorts of industries and products and services. Six trillion dollars, everybody. It wasn't there before. It's there now. It's all chasing the same few places. What are you doing with your six trillion dollars? Oh, I even forgot the funny story. I I digressed. I felt really conflicted. Mm. I I I was happy to get the money on one hand. I was scared shitless to have gotten the money. Like, oh my God, this is where our taxpayer dollars are going. Oh my God, this is the system working and the money flowed to me. I I mean, I, I... George, I also got a $250 child credit mm-hmm. check. Yeah. yeah. Uh, look, man, I don't need that 250 bucks. You know, I, I wish there was a way for the government to know that yeah. about me and, and redirect that money to, to people that could have used it more or yeah. programs that have been better suited to receive it. But any federal legislation, it's difficult because you're using, you know, a, a hammer to, yeah, they to weigh big fly. wands. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's they weigh, weigh, big, weigh big wands. And so, you know, in some situations it's great. And then other situations, it doesn't fit the situation at all. We sat around the table when we looked at that non-pay list and how instead of 15 people, it was now three people because we got $160,000 in. We were all sort of silent. We were looking around. I was looking at everybody. They were looking at me. They were, weren't sure why. I wasn't speaking. I was, wasn't sure if they knew what like, it, it was really bizarre. I mean, we sat there for a good five or seven minutes and just had an, Oh my God moment. Yeah. Uh, now that makes sense. And I'm still not sure if it was a good thing. Yeah. You know, there's a part of me. Well, this is all kind of a big experiment. I feel like at this point, you know, it, we, we don't know, we haven't done these kinds of things before. These yeah. kinds of financial moves. We haven't. Yeah. And there's a part of me that wonders, is it the right way to go? Is it, this is a form of, of, of regulating the marketplace. You know, there's a part of me that believes that we just sort of let the cookies crumble how they would have and work the issues out through the system the natural way. Some people would have moved on. Some people would have paid. Some people started working again. Some people didn't. Some people moved in with one another. There's COVID relationships. In one case, we had that. Had two people in separate apartments vacated and moved in together. And uh, that was interesting. But, you know, a free marketplace is typically the healthiest and best marketplace. During COVID, you know, the government printed all this money. I thought the extent of me experiencing the government's printing of money was going to be the $250 check that I got from mm. my, my child. Right. And then I walk into the office and it's $160,000 paid by 12 tenants across a vast number of buildings. They cleared up a lot of debt, a lot of arrears, and I can't wait to see some of my real estate property owner peers and ask them how they felt about it. Uh, And for those of you who are watching or listening, I'd love to hear from you below. Did you think it was crazy when you got paid? Were you ringing the bell and happy? Were you not happy? Were you scratching your head? 
I was a little bit of all of those. Now, this is something that I think I've hesitated to bring up in the past. You've hesitated. Well, I think we've, I think we've both hesitated. We've talked about it a little bit. But the Supreme Court ban uh, and lifting of eviction moratorium, it's something that we've, we, it's been going on for a little while and like through the last year. The ban uh, got uh, lifted a few yeah. weeks ago. Yeah, Thank so, God. Yes. Yeah, so what do you because think? Because I, th- yeah. I think... I think that the market has to operate freely. I think that the, the the property owners, the courts, the tenants have to go through the natural motions. It has to happen. You can't just artificially restrict that natural flow from happening. As we just talked about with the CARES Act money, I, I'm a proponent for free markets. I'm a proponent for low regulation in a business environment, at least in this case, in this business environment, so that the workouts can happen without restriction or imposition, which is unnatural. Anytime you try and impose an unnatural uh, chokehold upon a marketplace, there's major repercussions. So uh, when the eviction ban got lifted, I wasn't happy because I want to see people get evicted from their home. I wasn't happy because I want to see people have stress and problems and scurry to deal with their housing issues. That's not what I'm saying. I was happy that when the ban got lifted, the markets were able to operate in a less restricted or unrestricted manner so that it could all get worked out. We know that there is CARES Act money there that has to flow to the tenants and flow to the landlords to clear up all this debt. That wasn't able to happen. They put out, George, they put out $47 billion in the CARES Act for rent relief, uh-huh. and only $5 billion of it got distributed wow. as of about a month ago. So there's, 40, there's like $40, 41000000000 billion that, that was untapped. People couldn't get to it. It was disorganized. It was inefficient. All of those things prevented vast majority of that money, $40, $41 billion, getting to the tenants, getting to the property owners, clearing the rent debts. And it was just, it was a problem. So if you're not taking care of the economy, you're not taking care of anything else. You don't have the resources to take care of anything else. So by lifting the ban, they enabled the economy to get back to business. They enabled these businesses to get back to business when they uh, when the restrictions before the eviction moratorium got lifted, when, when, the, when the business restrictions got lifted. You got to get back to business. Now, we got to get back, back to business safely and responsibly and with a consciousness that includes everybody in our society, but we got to get back to business. These business restrictions are nuts because it stops people from working, it stops businesses from earning, and then you really got problems. So it's the economy, stupid. Take care of the economy. You're going to take care of 90%, 95% of of everything else after that. Sure, health is important. Sure, uh, mental mindset, mental health is critical. It's been a tough couple of years for for everybody. But you got to take care of business and the economy. People got to get back to work. The business has got to get open. And those things contribute to the th- you know mental health, to physical health. The, the, the economy plays into all of that. Yeah, I was just listening to a conversation with uh, some actors, Dax Shepard and Brie Larson, and they were they were talking about this about um, what did they have to say? About well, it? well, because there was uh, Shepard had posted something laughing with his daughter, and he had, get, had a comment on Instagram that someone said, "Oh, you know, I'd be laughing too if I was rich," and. Their point in the conversation was saying, obviously, wealth doesn't equal happiness. But they were also quick to say that having enough money to have resources to help you with your mental struggles and with your physical needs is definitely a requisite for at least you know, a baseline. Money doesn't make you happy, George. But not having money, it's a sure shit way to be unhappy or longer. Money doesn't make you happy today when you weren't happy yesterday. Right, you have to find contentment in whatever situation. It, it more happy. reveals yeah. the person that you were yesterday when you get money today. Money itself doesn't make you happy. Yeah. It's the, it's, man. I mean, I mean. So Dax you, Shepard said that? Yeah, yeah. You, and I mean, Brie Larson? Brie Larson, yeah, yeah. You, I, I mean, like her. She's great. Yeah, she's amazing. I, it, well, the thing that's interesting is, like, you can have all these conversations and end it almost entirely with, it's all about balance. You know, like you you could say that about everything. And I think with money, it is that way where you need to be responsible and pursue economic wealth for the good of you and the good of your family. But if that's the only thing you're pursuing is currency and not the things that it purchases, you'll be a little, you'll be a little empty. Yeah. But we need money, George. We need money to pay for healthcare. We need money to pay for, for school. We need money to pay for food. I think most people would agree that they'd be a little happier and a little better off if they had a little bit more money. So I encourage everybody, what are the ways that you can find more money? Go get more money. It's out there. There's $6 trillion out there. Yeah, so go get it. Go get yeah, some. Yeah. Take the Lord out of landlord. What does that mean? What does that mean for you? Why do you like this so much? I, there's something, it just rings, I think. I'm, a lit, I'm an alliteration junkie. So I think Lord, landlord, I love it. So 
Yeah, let me know. What does that mean? Take the Lord out of land. Well, now more than ever in today's world, charging money for housing Mm -hmm. is a controversial topic. Yeah, absolutely. And it was before. The the history of the landlord-tenant relationship, controversial, tense, stressed, right? The landlord and the tenant have never really seen eye to eye. As the tenant, I have to pay you money in order to put a roof over my head and my kid's head. And that's a pain in the ass. And when I don't, I get eviction papers. And when I don't, I get phone calls from the office wanting to collect. Uh, You know, that's the reality of the world we live in. You know what's happening more now than ever before? People from all different income levels, people from all different backgrounds are getting into not only home ownership, but rental home ownership, rental property ownership. And I'm seeing it every day. It's incredible. And that's what's pushing uh, the larger permanent capital, the big hedge funds and private equity funds to shift where they're looking for assets because it's, it's now more able than ever before for the common person to get the FHA loan and get into a duplex or a triplex or a fourplex and rent out a unit for themselves and rent the other three for, for profit. Now they're landlords, right? People are doing it every single day and it's, it's blurring the lines between the historical landlord-tenant populace because many of the people who were previously tenants are now shifting and becoming landlords themselves. And it's an incredible thing to see in society and in business. I think that's one of the major forces that's uh, behind, I think, taking lord out of landlord mm-hmm. because just that's such an historical term, landlord. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very so, different from your kind of vision of your role in real estate, I feel like, which is you talk a lot about service and providing service. service. People, it's a people business. And so I'm all for taking the Lord out of landlord, metaphorically speaking, because I think it brings us all together rather than divides us. I think the word landlord is a divisive term. Lord, I mean, Lord anything. It's like, uh, I don't know. Sounds like who's your daddy or something. It's it's a little a little weird in a business context. I don't call the people at the restaurant food lord, and I don't call the people at the Nike store shoe lord. Yeah. So why are people calling me landlord? So I'm all for taking lord out of landlord, and uh, I've always preferred the term property owner. I use it in my office. I use it in my emails, communications, yeah. all of my business dealings. I've tried to always use the word property owner instead of landlord. Uh, I think it's a more approachable phrase. And I think it's a more accurate phrase. More I mean, I own the yeah. property. And, uh, and with what's happening out there today with young people, old people, I'm seeing it every day uh, where they're selling their single family house and they're buying a duplex or a fourplex and they're renting out the other units while they live in one themselves. It's an amazing thing. And uh, I mean, millions of people are doing this. And it, it's not so cut and dry anymore where there's tenants and landlords. And I think it's a good thing for us. It, it's a uniting concept, taking the Lord out of landlord. I feel like the last time we were all united as a country was 9-11. Yeah. Uh, here we are in September. So 9-11, I think, was the last time I felt like our country, uh, our, the people in our country were really united over uh, one thing and being together and coming together. Since then, there's been nothing but division. Yeah. And recently, there's been nothing but division. Pandemic, pre-pandemic, now. Everywhere I look, it's divisive and division everywhere. So let's take the Lord out of landlord. Yeah. They can bring us all together. Love it. This is something we talked about our very first episode. Now we're in a new space for new lights, new cameras, all this stuff. And get up, get out, and get it done is I think maybe the first thing we talked about on our first episode. I want to revisit it and see, does that still resonate with you in the same way that it did? Then? Still. Yeah. It's part of my DNA, man. Yeah. You got to get up, you got to get out, you got to get it done. You know, there's two kinds of people, people that make excuses and people that get up and get out and get it done. And success comes from getting up and getting out and getting it done. Success doesn't come from making excuses. Achieving your goals doesn't come from delivering excuses. It comes from delivering results. And it's a very fine line. And people need to figure out how to throw the light switch and deliver action and results rather than excuses. You know, what do you want to do? Do you want to be someone that's known as an excuse person? I mean, I know these people. They're not great people. I avoid them. I can't be around them. I have nothing in common with people that make excuses. I have nothing in common with people that look to avoid taking action. I have nothing in common with people that don't want to get off their ass and work and do better and go the extra mile and grind it out. I mean, I, I find that to be the biggest uncommonality that I have with people as I go through life. And uh, so don't do it for me, do it for you. But if you're an excuse person, 
consider being a take action person. Yeah, I think it's interesting that when I started my kind of professional life, I think coming out of school, there's this idea of like, oh, there must be just this kind of right way to do everything because that's yeah. how school is. You know, there's a right answer and a wrong answer. And oftentimes you have to figure it out uh, as you go. And there might be a, a more efficient way, a less efficient way, but a lot of it is literally just doing the thing, doing the thing over and again and, and getting out and doing the thing. And it seems like it should be common sense, but I think for a lot of people, it's not. I think a lot of people default to, oh, well, I don't know how to do this, so I'm just right. not going to. Yeah. Or they default to, I don't want to try. I don't want to work past five o'clock. I want to get home and watch TV and sit on my ass, or I don't want to you know, put in the time. I don't want to put in the effort. You know, Our world is geared so that people that put in the time and effort and work and go above and beyond succeed. Our world is geared to limit and smack down those that want to just work a nine to five, five days a week and say, oh, I work so hard. Well, you work hard in your nine to five context, but the world isn't set up to reward you for that. The world is set up to, re- to reward those that go above and beyond, that break free out of the nine to five box, that work nine to five and also work five to nine, that work weekends, that are disciplined, that have good tenacity, that have the ability to repeat repeat, repeat actions until they become habits. And then those habits are the foundation for success. You got to take action. Action is what you need to be successful. So when you ask me, get up, get out, get it done, what does that mean to me? It means everything to me. Because without it, I'm nothing. And without it, you're nothing. You know, name me one successful person that was successful by sitting on their ass. What's that? Yeah, there are none. Yeah. You know, name me one successful person that became successful from, you know, making excuses. What's that? Right. There are none. So when you ask me, what does it mean? I mean, it's everything, man. Yeah. Get up and get out and get it done. If you want the extraordinary, you got to be extraordinary. All right. Well, that's what I got, Peter. Anything you want to touch on before we head out? Yeah, there is. Okay, cool. I have a problem. What's your problem? I miss ZestQuest. Oh, yeah. ZestQuests. It, it has been a while since we've done a ZestQuest. Yeah. Uh, I have one for you. Uh, fire away. In your career, mm-hmm. what have been your favorite color shoelaces? Oh, man. My career. I mean, on my white sneakers, I have white laces. On my brown shoes, I have brown laces. Yeah. You know, that kind of thing is normal. Anything stick out for you? On, I have a pair of Lem's boulder boots, which are zero drop shoes. I know you didn't ask for this, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. What the fuck that means? What did you so, say? So, yeah, so a zero drop shoe, Peter... <laughs> You didn't ask for this, but we're going here. It's a, it's a boot that the distance between your toe and your heel has no distance. So it's, and, it's and the same distance. millennials think this is good. Why? Uh, because it doesn't give you any false support for your foot. And so right. it's the natural curvature of your foot. Mm. And so I, I grew up being barefoot. And so it's the closest thing that I can do to be barefoot. Yeah. when I'm wearing shoes. So anyway, yeah. so I have those boulder boots. And, and you have, wear those shoes when you these, wear your skinny right. jeans uh, and absolutely. you eat your gourmet mustard? I absolutely do, yeah. yeah. Got and it. it has these laces that are brown and bright yellow that I really okay. like. Okay, well, that's really yeah. wanted to hear yeah. about was a lace. Brown yeah. and bright yellow. Brown and bright yellow. And I also use that for my guitar strap. Uh, oh. I, t- I take them from Look at my, that. my boot and I wrap it around my acoustic guitar. For those of you that are getting to know my man George here, he's an incredibly mus- musician, oh, great singer, great composer, Great artist, great uh, guitar player, drummer. So we're going to hear more a bit from him. We have a piece. Actually, m- maybe you can put it up here, uh, the, uh, the Dua Lipa piece yeah. that he wrote and produced and uh, scripted all of that. I thought it was fantastic. So now I buy and I rehab, I refinance and repeat. But not all real estate is equal, so I'm walking the street and buying up the multifamily from everyone I meet. Hot damn, I'll invest in apartments again. I'll invest in apartments again. So get to know my man, George. Yeah, thanks so He's much, my Peter. G-Rock. That's, that's very sweet of you. I appreciate that. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll come up with, let's see, I, I'm trying to think if there's any Zest quests that come off the top of my head. Um, recently, I did ask... I have a question for you. Yeah, yeah. I just said what types of people that I feel I have nothing in common with? What types of people do you feel that you have nothing in common with? (sighs) Nothing in common with. See, a good guy like George doesn't want to answer that question because he wants to feel like he's got commonality with everyone. No, I'm just trying to make sure that I'm accurate. 
I don't know if this is a direct answer to a question, but what comes to mind is what's frustrated me a lot recently is people leveraging the suffering of others for political ammo, that I see that Ooh. a lot. And yeah. it's, not, it's not always uncalled for. I think sometimes you do see terrible things happen and you should say, hey, this was avoidable. These people did this wrong. We should do better than that. Yeah. But when the, I think on social media, I see the impulse seems to always be to go there first and to always say, hey, these people fucked up and you know, this is why, as opposed to maybe just acknowledging that suffering with the people that are suffering. So 9-11 is a good example. I think like a lot of people were, you know, mourning that this yeah. last weekend and to just mourn it, like just, just mourn with the people that are upset. Let it breathe, and, let it yeah, marinate. Yeah. And don't, it, you don't have to speak about the politics of it right away. Like, you, you don't know, always have to speak. Yeah, that's true too. Yeah. No, less, totally. less is more. Yeah, less is more. Nine eleven's yeah. a great example. I'm glad yeah. you said that. Just, yeah. just take a take a minute, sit yeah. back, and breathe through that, man. Yeah. So I think uh, yes, there's definitely things that need to be done post and pre nine eleven. But when people are mourning, I feel like let them mourn and d- seek solidarity first, rather than the political ammo. So I, I think that's who I feel the most contention with right now is people who are doing that. Um, Thanks yeah. for answering yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank All you right. so much. Welcome to Q&A, Peter. Um, got some, some questions from our, our fans or listeners. I guess it might be a little pretentious to say fans, but at least, at least listeners. I was going to say we've uh, never used that word fans. Yeah, Let's yeah. just say viewers, listeners. Yeah. Right now, I know it's my mom. <laughs> uh, it's my friend Dave. Yeah. And it's my brother. I don't even think my wife watches anymore. Yeah. So, so we at least got that going for us. Yeah. So I got that going for me, which is nice. Yeah, Whoever's out there, thank you. Yeah, yeah, 100%. All right, so this is from uh, Martin Sheehan. He goes... Martin Sheen? Yeah, yeah. One of my <laughs> favorite actors. It's great. You know, we'll have to get him on the podcast sometime. Yeah. That would be really interesting. Yeah. Uh, he goes, hey, Peter, been following for a hey, while. Martin. Thanks for the great content. Yeah. I've heard you talk about FHA loans as a way to start breaking into real estate. Can you talk a little bit about how an FHA loan works, how to use it, how to qualify? Thanks. So, Martin, from a lender's perspective... There's two different categories of multifamily assets uh, based on size. So one to four units and then five units and up. Martin, I operate in five units and up, so I don't really have the FHA as part of my lender pool. I typically go to local and regional banks as well as Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae. Uh, But for those of you out there who are seeking to purchase uh, one to four family homes, you can do so with an FHA loan. An FHA loan is desirable. Uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, the underwriting is very standardized, so you can get quite quickly an approval or know really what you're going to be able to get uh, from an approved FHA lender. Number two, the loan to value that you'll get in an FHA loan is significantly higher than you'll get in a non-FHA commercial loan product. So for me, I'll get 70 or 75% LTV, but for an FHA borrower, you'll get 95, 96, 97 percent LTV to purchase your one to four family home. You will live in one of the units, you'll rent out the others, and that's how you get into multifamily using an FHA loan product. There's a lot of qualified FHA lenders out there. I suggest that if you're interested in learning more about it, you go seek one of them out. They're all over the place. You could DM me. I know a few of them, so I'll make some recommendations. Uh, but it's a great way to get into multifamily. Uh, where you're living in one of the units and renting out the others. Uh, Again, if it's a one to four family product, you should check out FHA because you'll get a higher loan to value. The interest rate's typically pretty competitive. Man, I wish they had that kind of product for for me, George. Uh, So I'd love to get a higher leverage amount and live in one of my buildings and and get to uh, operate the building while I'm living there. Actually, I did that. That's how I started out. That's, I mean, I was, I was joking. I wouldn't like to lever up to 90 or 95% because in my business, that's not a great thing. But when I started off, I lived in uh, a six family and I rented out uh, five units and lived in one myself. That's how I got started. Yeah. You got to run before you can walk or yeah. the other way around. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Sounds great. Thanks so much, Peter. And, uh, Thanks, Martin. I'll, I'll see you next week. If 
you like what you just heard, you can subscribe to The Daily Cash Flow on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And we'd love it if you left us a review. You can follow us on Twitter and Facebook at SiegelCap and on Instagram at Siegel.cap. As always, if you're an accredited investor, go to SiegelCapital.com and take our survey to see if you qualify to take part in one of our apartment building deals. That's S-I-E-G-E-L Capital.com. 